See, I don't think, uh, see, in our country we have a diagnostic test, one single value, and it is very cost effective. And uh, all patients are, uh, when they are diagnosed, we say it's uh, gestational diabetes, we keep them under very close surveillance so that we can improve on the parental outcome. And only those required who are not meeting the criteria level of a below 90 fasting and uh, below 140, 120 postprandial. We don't treat them. We keep them under close observation. So I think the cost effectiveness does not come into our, uh, in our country, I think. Thank you. We'll have the discussion after the two talks. It's a pleasure to invite Dr. Richard Quinton who has come all the way from Newcastle. He was also my program director when I was training. It's a pleasure to have you here, Richard. And he did his MBBS in Cambridge University. He did his, got his FRCP from the Royal College of Physicians, Edinburgh. He's a treasurer of the European Association of Medical Specialities. And he's in a num number of groups. But I note that his special interest is treatment of hypogonadism and hormone replacement therapy and genetics on top of this. So welcome, Richard. So many thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to, to be here. And it's also a pleasure to see so many gynecologists in the audience. When I was preparing, so this talk has been redacted. When I prepared the talk, I said to Moose, I've got lots of gynecology jokes in this. He said, no, no, there's lots of gynecologists in the audience. I'll, I'll put some more in. No, no, no jokes. So it's been redacted to the original version, hopefully to Dr. Mutagumaratha's uh, satisfaction. Um, I'm going to talk about female hypogonadism, particularly in relation to hormone replacement. And I think what I will say up front may be controversial to you. Um, and I'm also going to discuss a little bit uh, about hypogonadism and hormone replacement in relation to, to fertility in these women. So in summary, I'm going to talk about other published guidelines in HRT for hypogonadal women in the reproductive age group. So we're not talking about menopause of HRT. And are these guidelines evidence-based? And more importantly, do they make any logical sense? what kinds of HRT products are available and how do they differ? And actually, are there lessons from men? Are there lessons from how we manage testosterone replacement in regular hypogonadal men, or how we manage estrogen replacement uh, in men who've had their balls chopped off and are transitioning to, uh, to be females having hormone replacement? I think they might, we'll, we'll go on to that. Um, and finally, I'm going to discuss really what I think is the rationale for titrated, individually adjusted estradiol replacement rather than blind therapy with some random hormones as currently tends to happen. Um, and I'm also going to reflect how the uh, hormone replacement of estradiol has important uh, ramifications for the uterine maturation in young hypogonadal women uh, and therefore uh, on how they might be able to carry pregnancy uh, uh, in future life. So what's the purpose of sex hormone replacement in your young hypogonadal woman? So, uh, to achieve and maintain adequate bone density and reduce your fraction of the later life back down to baseline. To a bit normal sexual functioning. So, one of the things that gynecologists are very good at asking their patients is, you know, do you get any discomfort during sex? When it comes, we tend to forget about it. And just for all the guys in the audience, okay, if we had any discomfort during sex, do you think we'd ever have sex again? We'd stop tomorrow, wouldn't we? So, why should women have to put up with it? Um, to eliminate vasomotor symptoms. Interesting that actually, um, why don't girls have vasomotor symptoms? So it seems you have to have been exposed to estrogen for some point and then to have it withdrawn uh, to experience uh, these. Um, and to reduce the long term cardiovascular risk back down to, to, to baseline. And if you're inducing puberty with estrogens, to achieve breast development according to genetic potential. And I think what we need to think about as well uh, is we need to actually act to achieve uterine development according to genetic potential as well. So what do the guidelines tell us? And are they actually telling us the truth? So let's start with what I think is possibly the worst guideline that, I ever, that I've ever seen. This is HRT and hypertrichism in adults from the, from the American Endocrine Society published about three years ago. And this is what it says in the section about female sex hormone replacement. So this bit makes sense. So hypertrichism or oristrin will require higher doses of, of growth hormone if they're on growth hormone. So it's true that that's actually a huge oversimplification. If you're on ethanol estradiol, which is what's contained in most contraceptive pills, 
then you will need a massively increased dose of growth hormone uh, to achieve the same level of insulin-like growth factor one. Um, if you're on a preverin-based product, horse estrogen, you will need a substantially increased dose of growth hormone to achieve the same level of, of IGF-1. Uh, whereas if you're actually on physiological 17-beta-estradiol-based HRT, particularly if that's uh, transdermal, you will need a whole lot less growth hormone to achieve, this, to achieve the same IGF-1 target. So it's true, but it's a gross oversimplification. And then it comes out with this factoid. So a factoid is something which seems like a fact. It seems plausible, uh, but actually it's just based in someone's fantasy, but it's just gained credence through endless repetition. So the oral contraceptive pill may be more acceptable than HRT for younger females. It's a factoid. I've never encountered a single woman who said, please give me the pill. And in fact, I've never encountered a colleague even when patients said that. So we just need to just strike that out. Bill said, studies compare these two regimens are lacking. Well, that's true. Um, studies are also lacking uh, in hypogonadal men uh, comparing testosterone to nandrolone. But why the hell would you ever want to do that study? We'll come back to that. So then the guidelines talk about estrogens available in many forms. Oral, transdermal, intravaginal creams, tablets and rings. Now actually, all the intravaginal preparations, creams, tablets and rings, that's not systemic HRT. That's just to increase, to allow, to, to eliminate vulvagal atrophy, to allow sex without it being very, very painful. So that's the equivalent of Viagra for men. Viagra for men is not hormone replacement, it's to assist in sexual function. So we can see that those who generated these guidelines characterized by actually spectacular ignorance. They should stick to just probably pituitary. They also said the final thing, measuring serum estradiol levels is not beneficial. Like, where did you get that from? I'm not aware of any evidence for that. And it says some estrogens are not detected by the assays. Well, actually, the only estrogen that's not detected by the assays isn't an estrogen. And that's ethanol estradiol, which is the kind of anabolic steroid, which is the uh, component of the contraceptive pill. Uh, the assays, the immunoassays, will even detect horse estrogen, primarily. So I, I'm, I'll try and be less bad-tempered now. So other guidelines. So the NICE guidelines. So the NICE guidelines of menopause um, also have, of course, statement three, talking about managing premature ovarian insufficiency. Uh, and that's it. That's it. That's all we have to say. Women with, women with premature ovarian insufficiency are off HRT or a combined oral contraceptive. And that's it. And then also some guidelines that I was involved in. The European consensus statement on congenital hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, including Kalman syndrome. And so they have to say. Estradiol, we decided, yes, we will go for the human replacement rather than the horse replacement or the anabolic replacement. Estradiol is given orally, one to two milligram daily, or transdermally, 50 microgram patch, or one to two pumps of 0.06% gel daily, with a cyclic progesterone. So these were written effectively in 2004. 13, 14, to published 2015, and at the time, I didn't know any better. Look at these now, I'm thinking, these doses are totally inadequate for a young hypogonadal woman. So what estrogens are there out there? We have the 70 bit estradiol, which is your dominant um, circulating uh, estrogen in premenopause. Uh, we have conjugating equine estrogens, uh, or premarin, uh, it comes from horse piss. Um, we know that actually, from recent uh, survey of UK GP records, uh, that actually there's a greater risk of venous thromboembolism in women receiving premarin based hormone replacement compared to those receiving 17 uh, beta estradiol based hormone replacement. And actually, in trans women, so these are men, people who were born male, had their balls chopped off and are now taking estrogen as replacement, their risk on premarin is, of DVT, polymerase, is eight times greater than that for trans women uh, taking a 70 beta estradiol based form of replacement. Then we have the anabolic steroid, ethanol estradiol, which is the component of virtually all contraceptive pills uh, throughout the, the world. We know that there's an increased risk of VTE in Uganda women, massively increased risk in, in, in transgender women. Um, there's an increased risk of cardio, there's a doubling of risk of cardiovascular death in trans women, so these are women who were born male, had their bulls chopped off, uh, taking ethanol estradiol as form replacement. 
Um, and it also increases the blood pressure, and that's by activating renin. So that's what being on the contraceptive pill puts your blood pressure up, whereas taking a conventional hormone replacement does not do so. And then, of course, ethanol is a powerful inhibitor of growth hormone IGF IGF-1 generation. And you can't measure serum levels, so you can't touch it the dose. It's just take this, go away, get lost. Let's hope it works. So just to give you a, a very clear schematic of, of, what, of how the concept will looks like compared to a replacement. So it's 21 days, ethanol, estradiol, and a progesterone. Seven day gap, then you restart again. During that seven day gap, you have the period. And also during that seven day gap, if you're a hypogonadal woman, that's when you get hot flushes and sex dysfunction because actually you have no estrogen protection for one week in four. Home replacement cyclical, effectively your estrad it's estradiol this time, and it's continuous. The progesterone is, is, is in the two weeks on, two weeks off. And you tend to have your period just before you, you finish the progesterone or just after you finished it. But there's no break in the estradiol dose. And that's cool. Uh, if you have continuous um, combined, the estradiol dose is the same, but your progesterone dose is half the dose, but it's spread out over the entire cycle continuously. And even better, and I think this is one of the greatest advances in gynecology over the last uh, 50 years, is the marina coil, which just releases a small amount of progesterone into the uterine lining to prevent endometrial hyperplasia. Um, and so you can take estrogen only oral or transdermal hormone replacement without flooding your whole body with progesterone. I, I, I envy my gynecology colleagues. They're able to put my readers in. I can't do it. I wish I could. So, what comparators are there in terms of contraceptive pill versus fixed dose hormone replacement? Um, so, we know that 24 hour blood pressure is higher significantly, both systolic and diastolic, if you're on the contraceptive pill compared to estrogen progesterone hormone replacement. Uh, we also know that your bone density improves rather better with hormone replacement uh, compared to the contraceptive pill. And that's even with a relatively crude fixed dose estradiol based replacement. And we know that um, uh, EG, EGFR is improved on H, better on HRT and your, your markers of bone formation are rather better. Uh, another study was a two year open label RCT. So everyone knew what they were taking, open label, but it was um, fixed dose hormone replacement, contraceptive pill, and then there was a group of women who refused treatment, uh, and so they were kind of like a pseudo-controlled group. And the main outcome was in terms of bone density. You can see there's quite a, not that many women, and you can see that quite, there was quite a lot of trial dropout. But essentially, both HRT and the contraceptive pill were better than no treatment. Uh, but actually, in terms of bone density, the results definitely favoured hormone replacement. Even though, as I said, it was fixed dose, uh, there was no individualised dose of titration. So, let's think about what do we do for hypogonadal men on testosterone? So, first of all, the WHA in 1992 very sensibly said we only use native testosterone, not to the androgens. We're not going to treat men with nandrolone or methyl testosterone or whatever. We're going to treat them with native testosterone. It's the endogenous hormone. And you can measure a serum level. And actually, you should measure a serum level and use that to adjust the dose of testosterone accordingly. So it's interesting. So, you can say that's for men. How is it okay to treat women with a random dose of estradiol or even with a synthetic estrogen? And a or with a sort of horse xenoestrogen molecule. It, it doesn't quite seem right. Actually, it's neither safe nor sensible, but it's our fault because we have neglected this aspect of endocrinology and we haven't worked closely with our uh, gynecology colleagues to, to address this. So a few years ago, shortly after I was involved in the uh, guidelines uh, for um, hypogonadism, hyper uh, I became involved in the uh, the transgender uh, multiple team in the Northeast, largely run by psychiatrists. And so this is what they have to say, these guidelines, about transgender women. So specifically, these are people who were born male, had their balls chopped off in HRT, they're having estradiol or estrogen as the hormone replacement. 
They clearly obviously don't need to progest it. It's not having uterus. So, echinacetidine is associated with increased cardiovascular mortality and is no longer recommended. Both ethanol, estradiol, and premarin orsistrin result in a procoagulant hemostatic profile in trans women with increased risk of polymeralism and DVT and are thus not recommended. The estradiol dose depends on circulating serum estradiol levels. We recommend that estradiol levels should be in the upper half to third of the female follicular range, depending on the laboratory, but in our range it's about 300 to 600 picomol per litre. And the doses, oral estradiol, one to six milligrams a day, gel, one to three milligrams a day, patch, 50 to 200 micrograms, change twice a week. So these, first of all, it's actually saying, check a level. And it's also, if you look at the doses, they're a whole lot higher than would ordinarily be used. And part of that is because men are bigger, but it's also partly because Actually, if you are seeking to target therapy according to a level, you will be forced to use higher doses than those that have been historically used. So, I, you know, I think I'm a big expert in endocrinology. Those psychiatrists taught me quite a lot. The scales fell from my eyes. So, what is, in terms of the rationale for a titrated approach to estradiol replacement, so there's the biochemical rationale. So, here's a study from Jargon long time ago, look at comparing estrogen concentrations and biodiversity, both after a single dose of oral, gel, or patch estradiol, and also in steady state. They found the oral biodiversity was significantly higher than the transdermal. They also found a very wide intersubject variability in estradiol levels. So in the same way that you can't give 75 mics of thyroxine to every woman, or 200 mics of thyroxine to every man, you have to adjust it individually if you wish to achieve uh, biochemical euthyroidism. Same applies to estradiol. They commented that individual estrogen may be needed when changing form of administration. They didn't take it to its logical step, which was, which was that individual estrogen is needed for everybody. So another study more recently, um, JCM, this looked at normal healthy menstruating girls followed across their whole menstrual cycle, and so what is your integrated mean estradiol concentration if you're a healthy young girl? That between 300 and 400 picomol per litre. Another study, this looked at mean estradiol levels in women with Turner syndrome, done well, done so well taking oral estradiol, incremental doses, so they started off on oral estradiol, <coughs> so actually half of them had oral estradiol, 0.5 milligrams a day, and that's the kind of level they're achieving, very low. 661 meter. Those at higher dose or estradiol, 2 milligrams a day, a bit better, 169 picomol per liter, but still below what you would expect a normal healthy young girl to be making endogenously. Then transdermal, the lower dose patch, again uh, inadequate. Uh, the higher dose patch, yes, you're achieving something, something similar to that which might be uh, found in, in, a, in, a, in a healthy young girl. So effectively, what we're saying is that oral hormone replacement operations that are formulated to suppress menopausal hot flushes may well achieve inadequate estradiol concentrations in hypogonadal women in terms of maintaining bone density, reducing cardiovascular risk, uh, achieving normal sex and function. So that's the biochemical rationale for a kind of titrated hormone replacement. And here's the metabolic rationale, uh, again from um, Conway's uh, group in London who will study the Turner women. This is a nine-month sequential estradiol dose ranging study over 12 weeks. So effectively, um, 25 women with gadal dysgenesis or Turners, they started off on one milligram estradiol a day, then up to two, then up to four milligram um, a period of three months each. And what they found was that as you increase the estradiol dose, so there was significant reductions in carotid intermediate thickness on ultrasound. Uh, and of course that's IMT is a predictor for over, your overall vascular health. And they also found reduction in fasting plasma glucose, and they found an increase in serum HDL cholesterol. And look at the serum estradiol levels achieved, one milligram a day, 265, two milligrams a day, 371, four milligrams a day, 642. So even though on two milligrams a day they were getting a reasonable biochemical response, actually to get the complete benefit in terms of IMT, 
uh, HDL and the glucose, you need to go a bit higher. Just to say that the maximum dose of oral estradiol in a standard HD preparation would be two milligrams a day. Talking about fertility in female hypogonadism, so obviously intrinsic very dysfunction, primary, your light belt's broken, secondary, your light switch is off, not much you do with primary apart from egg donation, although women with autoimmune premature ovarian insufficiency um, often have positive TPO antibodies, there's around a, about a 5% spontaneous ovulation uh, rate, and so they can just occasionally fall pregnant. Uh, hypog, hypog. Um, so here, fertility is really straightforward. So with either gonadotropin or generated ovulation induction, you can achieve cumulative conception rates as per a normal couple. So imagine, injection FSH a day under ultrasound control, you're pulling out a, one nice big fat juicy follicle. When you've done that, injection of HCG, trigger ovulation, go away, have sex, fall pregnant. Brilliant. What are the obstacles? Well, first of all, you know, fertility clinics want to make money. They can make a whole lot more money out of IVF, so they will try and push these women down the IVF pathway, the dollars or, or rupees. The other thing is, is that they may forget to give luteal support with progesterone, which means the initial pregnancy may not be uh, maintained. So there's some great curative pregnancy rates. So the, yeah, this, this is from the UCH group where endocrinologists and gynecologists have worked hand in hand for um, uh, hand in glove for uh, decades. And you can see ovulation rates, maximum cycle, pregnancy, 96% in six cycles. Obviously less in the women who are pan hypopituitary. And the, pre and the maintenance of pregnancy, the miscarriage rate is higher than in, should say, regular women. So fertility in a woman, it's ovulation, it's fertilization, maybe the embryo transfer if it's, it's, it's IVF, it's implantation, and it's maintenance of pregnancy to term. So if you imagine the guy as the sperm and the, and the, and the woman as, as the egg, it's not just that they have to meet, they need a house for the baby to grow in. And uh, the house uh, is the uterus, and you can see how it changes hugely in size and configuration uh, across the normal puberty. And, and here we see on, on the left a kind of tiny sort of um, uh, uterus uh, of pre-puberty, and here we have the rather more mature uh, uterus um, post-puberty. So the uterus increases in length, width and depth to achieve a mature adult configuration. The cervix gets shorter, the fundus longer, and the, and the cross section goes from tubular to heart-shaped. Um, and so UCL group did a study of hypogonadal women who completed pubertal induction with them. Nine hypochypogs, 19 POIs, 28 turners. And this is a group that's really good, that's very, very good on female HRT. And what they found was that the hypogonadal women had a much later major menarche, and actually all parameters of uterine dimensions were much less than in the control group. The control group normally nulliparous who had male factor infertility. And here are the figures here. So every single dimension, even with what seems to be optimal pubertal induction, the uterus is a downside smaller, less able to support a future pregnancy. So we've been rather fixated on um, to pubertal induction on breast development, on achieving normal breast development, and you can see that that is uh, maximum for a woman, a human woman, is about stage four or five. Clearly, obviously, if you're Parvati, then you can maybe reach stage six, and that's a lovely um, uh, statuette from the museum here in, uh, in, uh, in Chennai. So, your reproductive rationale for tetrate estradiol replacement in happy adult women. Incremental estrogen achieves the best final breast development outcomes, um, but we really don't think about uterine development as a marker of pubertal maturation. And we need to think about that as an objective uh, as well. And we may, may need to give higher doses of estradiol in order to achieve optimum uterine maturation in hypogonadal women. And we know that ethanol estradiol may achieve spectacularly poor uterine development. We already know that if you have a young woman with Turner's or Kalman's and you stick her on the pill straight off, that is a catastrophe for breast development. They will, they will never develop full adult breasts, and something similar may actually apply in terms of uterine development. Uh, some brief data from Newcastle, which we're still uh, looking at. Uh, all, all my Turner women, all my hyper, hyper women, Kalman's, um, all on hormone replacement. Um, only in 65 out of 100 women 
do we actually achieve serum estradiol levels in the target range? And those who did, one third of them required estradiol doses that were higher than regular, non-standard. So they, they need to wear two patches at once, 100, another 100, or 150 patch at the same time. Or gel, um, more than more, two, two, two sachets of gel a day, or if they're an oral, more than two milligrams a day. So that meant taking a normal oral HRT plus some extra estrogen on top of that. So effectively, what we're saying is that standard HRT is inadequate for nearly 60% of hyperglyn adult women. So my conclusions, hyperglyn adult girls should receive tiny biotin induction with doses of 70 estradiol, incrementing until adequate breast and uterine maturation has been achieved. Hyperglyn adult women should be treated with physiological HRT regimes based on 17 beta estradiol, not other molecules, not synthetic estrogens as in the pill, and not with horse estrogen. HD products don't contain enough estradiol for the metabolic bone and grip health of most hyperglyn women, and so therefore conventional HD products should be supplemented with additional estradiol when inadequate serum levels um, are achieved. Um, endocrinology. endocrinology, what do we do? We replace the missing hormone. How do we replace it? We check a blood test and we adjust the dose. But until now, we've not been doing it for estradiol um, and we really need to start. Thank you very much.